ZO here in the UK and also us, the Zionist Federation of the UK and Ireland. Um, thank you again for taking time out to join us for, for what we hope and um, what we hope and assure that, are, you know, are very exciting events for you. And this one in particular, where we get to, um, where we get to, to sort of travel virtually over to, over to Israel and um, experience uh, some of the country just from the, the comfort of our own homes whilst we're all still uh, fairly restricted. So, so thanks for taking the time out. Um, On to some house rules. We have muted all of you, but please feel free to turn on your videos um, because it gives it gives us all a, a feeling of, of more of a more of a, a guided tour a tour group together. Um, the only thing is that obviously because we we like to focus on on our on our guest speaker um, and the and the sound of the movies that we'll be playing, um, we've just we 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 ask that you all stay muted. Um, but please please do feel free if you haven't got your videos on, please do feel free to turn them on um, at any time. So, um, so yes, thank you for joining us. We hope that you're all well and um, enjoying some of the, the the freedoms that have come with this latest uh, relaxation of the of the restrictions. Um, hopefully, all being well. If things continue as they are, then we'll be we're all on track to to sort of come out of it late May, early June time. Um, and you know, please God on to on to better times and back to a, a degree of normality. So this evening, once again, we are joined by um, Dr. Tuvia Book, author, educator, ex-combat soldier um, in the IDF, and um, proud Zionist. This evening, he is once again going to take us on a virtual tour. This time, it's in the north of Israel in the Galilee, and we are going to be guided around the ancient capital, or uh, the ancient Roman capital of Tsipori um, in the Galilee. And it's a place where in history, um, Jews, pagans, Christians, all coexisted in, in, in relative harmony. And um, we are going to, to hear all about that from, from Tuvia as he, as he guides us around the site. So I think, um, just as a few more people are coming in, if we can just have you all turning on your videos and all keeping keeping your microphones muted, that will be great. Please do submit any um, please do submit any uh, uh, questions into the chat, and we will do our very best to to present as many of them to to Tuvia uh, towards at the end at the end once he's he's finished his presentation. Um, and I think without further ado, I shall pass on to Tuvia. So Tuvia, over to you. Hello everyone. So one of the things that uh, Steve in his wonderful introduction neglected to mention was part of that normality, hopefully, will be getting yourselves back to Israel. Um, uh, I was just talking to a friend the other day about an American writer called Samuel Longhorn Clements, otherwise known as Mark Twain, whose best-selling book was called The Innocence Abroad. And interestingly enough, we talk about history repeating itself. So he talks about how in the 19th century, he had some major financial issues. And he decided that he was going to do make up for all his lost uh, revenues by touring Europe and the Holy Land. So he went with a bunch of Quaker pilgrims, the Innocents in the title Innocents Abroad, and this ended up being his best selling book. In fact, it made him a fortune. Why? Because back in the 19th century, the only way for people to go to these places in the United States was vicariously. Very few people could take off months of their lives and go for a two week sail and go around Europe by horse and cart. And basically the only way they're ever gonna visit Rome or Egypt or the Holy Land was through Mark Twain's writings. So <laughs> today in the 21st century, we're back on that same thing where basically the only way people can visit uh, Israel for now is vicariously, especially from the UK. So we'll do the best we can do, but of course, nothing replaces the experience. So today we're going to be going to uh, the capital of the Galilee, to Tsipori. But of course, the best thing you can do is actually get yourselves over where you can use have essential 
time and smell it and touch it and walk it and hear it and and see it and that's of course the the best experience this is a close second best again the technology is amazing that i can be talking about one place guiding it from my house and you could be watching it thousands of kilometers away in uh, the uk so we should all be grateful for the times that we live in uh, and of course, in Israel, uh, the COVID battle is nearing an end, apparently, 222, where even in public places now, people don't have to wear masks. And most of the tourist sites, in fact, all the tourist sites are open, but as of now, to internal tourism. And we're hoping at the end of May, it'll be open also to other tourists from outsiders or non-Israeli tourists who are vaccinated. But as of now, we are going to pop over to Tsipori. So let's get this started. And we're going to look at, first of all, where Tsipori is. So um, you can all see this. Can you all see the PowerPoint? This is Tsipori on top. We have a nod. OK, so basically, Tsipori is a city in uh, an ancient city. And also there's a modern moshav next to it in the Galilee. If you see over here, Tsiporis, this is its uh, Greek Roman name, Tsiporis. And back in days of yore, not just days of mine, but days of yore, when people wanted to build a city, it was about three things. Location, location, location. So each ancient city had to have with it, of course, the four Ds, had to be a place where you could uh, drink, where there's water, a place you could drive to, that's drink and drive, obviously not together. Uh, in other words, on a major trading route. And also a place, where, the other D is dining, where you could get food. And the last D, of course, was defense, easy to defend. But you'll see with Tsipori, as we're about to descend into Tsipori, it's actually built on top of a hill, if you look at the right picture. Um, and we're going to be visiting some of the sites you can see in this picture. We'll be looking at the Dionysus Mosaic. We'll be looking at the theater, the Roman theater. We're looking at the sixth century synagogue and the town itself, which was at the bottom. But the nerve center, of course, was on the hill itself. And the Talmud even says the name Tsipori comes from the word Sipor, which is a bird in Hebrew, where the uh, city's location made it look like a bird on a hill. Yoshev Kitsipor Laha, that it sat like a bird on a mountain. And of course, location was prime. And over here, you have the major north-south route on this side called Derech HaMelech, or the King's Highway, which is more or less the Jordan River today. Uh, and on the, this side of the country, on the east side, you had what was called the Derech Hayam, or the Via Maris, the, King, the sea route, all part of the ancient Fertile Crescent. And Tsipori, as you can see, oh, Tsipori connected both uh, the King's Highway with the sea route. So location was paramount. But of course, like anything else in Israel, uh, it's not just where it's situated, it's also what is around it. So whilst you do have an ancient city, which is amazing, you also have a modern uh, settlement next to it. You have a Moshav called Moshav Tsipori, an agricultural uh, semi-communal lifestyle community next to it with the same name. And at the bottom of the valley, you have a modern Orthodox town called Hoshaya. And over the road, there is a kibbutz uh, called uh, Kibbutz Bet Rimon, which many Jews from the UK actually settled in as well. So it's not just the ancient past, it's also the present, which will be part of our focus today as well. So without... Uh, before we head on to the film, I wanted to show you an aerial shot. We, we mentioned it's like a bird, but if you look at it from a bird's eye view, you can see it's incredibly excavated. These, all these five by five meter squares over here, the archeological squares, and underneath them, you can see over here, this is the deck, this is the Decimanus, the secondary main Roman route, which we'll see in the film, uh, went from west to east. Over here is part of the Cardo Maximus, the north to south route you see in any Roman town. And this covered area over here is an area of immense interest in mosaics, uh, which we will see in the film itself. But all of this vast area is literally just 10% of the city itself. It's just the commercial center. 90%, including most of residential areas, still yet to be excavated and underground. Welcome to Israel and have a nice day. There's so much things to dig and so much to excavate. It's impossible to dig everything all the time. So all the tour we're going to do today is going to be on the 10 percent that is excavated, including the city center. And over here to the north, we'll be looking at the Roman theater. And of course, one of the big poles is this mosaic over here, which we'll be talking about on the right, 
which is known as the Mona Lisa of the uh, Galilee. And it, quite simply, it's an exquisite mosaic, a kind of quality you would see in a, a very, very uh, well-to-do Roman house. Uh, if anyone's been to Pompeii, you'll notice some of the richer houses have mosaics of this quality, um, where, of course, it's all about the DPI, or the dots per inch. The smaller the squares, the more expensive the mosaic. And this particular face, like the celebrated Mona Lisa, which might or might not be the real one in the Louvre, um, uh, the eyes seem to follow you everywhere. And it also has 23 different shades of color in the face. It's absolutely exquisite and shows that some of the people who lived in Tsipori were extremely wealthy indeed. And one of the most famous residents of Tsipori in the Roman period was none other than Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, the person who put the whole Mishnah together. And it was a mixed city, as we'll see, of pagans and Jews. And later on, when, with uh, the Byzantine period, uh, when the Eastern Roman Empire adopted Christianity, there was also Christians to add into the mix as well. So we had Christians, Jews, and pagans. And unlike many of the cities in uh, Judea, this was never destroyed by the Roman army in either revolt, neither the first revolt, the Great Revolt, 66 to 73 CE, or the Barkov Revolt, the simple reason that the citizens of this city did not want to fight. So both of them, when both wars started, they opened their city to the Roman armies and therefore was not destroyed. That's why it's in a quite a good state of preservation, where ultimately did destroy the cities, what destroyed most of Israel in the eighth century. And that of course was that massive earthquake because Syria is on the Syrian African rift. Uh, Israel, unfortunately, is its location there. And uh, most of it was buried under the ground where it remained for almost one and a half thousand years until uh, it is being excavated now by Israeli archaeologists. So the first half of the talk, we're going to focus on the city generally. And the second half of the talk, we are going to focus on this particular building, which is the synagogue in uh, Tsipori, which like most things in Israel, were discovered completely by accident when they were expanding the site to build a parking lot. They just happened to find a one and a half thousand year old synagogue with beautiful mosaic floors underneath the earth. So let's, without further ado, Steve, let's pop over to the first part of the presentation, when you'll see three people, the Trinity, very much uh, a theme of Christianity, running through the site of Tsipori. You'll see myself, you see my brother, Avigdor, who's actually a, a much better runner than I am. He runs ultra marathons and marathons, including the famous Comrades Marathon in South Africa that he got a silver medal at last time. That's only 93 kilometers. Uh, and you'll also see our good friend Shmuel Chantal, uh, the South African tour guide, uh, who's got a much more heavy South African accent than I do. Uh, and he is the one who also put this together and did the editing. So the three of us are going to run through ancient Sipori. Also, we're going to look at some of the modern surroundings and bring you with us to explore the capital of the ancient Galilee. Rakasha, Steve. Wonderful. Okay, everyone sit back and enjoy. Good afternoon, Shmuel Chantal, the running tour guide, together with Dr. Book, Comrade Book. You better give us a book when you come to Israel. We are going to take you to the capital of the Galilee of 2,000 years ago. What's our aim? We're going to see where mosaics were produced. Nazareth, the hills behind me, but where we are, Tsipori, this was the capital. This was the main center. It was a good location for a city. It had the four Ds. Drink, drive, not together obviously, defense, and dining. So it's a beautiful fertile land over here for the food. The defense, you'll see the city was built on top of a hill. In fact, the very name Tsipori means uh, a bird. And the Talmud says, your chef Kitsipor alaha. The city sat like a bird on the mountain. So it's a beautiful place to defend on a major driving route, a trade route between the Derch the King's Highway, and the Via Maris, the seacoast. This is 
one of the major roads that actually went from east to west and connected these two major north-south trade routes. And on top of that, the only question that was left is, where does the water come from for the drinking? There's one very small spring here, which clearly enough is not big enough to supply a city of thousands. The answer for the water, of course, is right underneath our feet. Dr. Book, the specialist. Harry Dogbook, the trail specialist. So it's going to be a bit of history, a bit of fun, and hopefully a bit of adventure as we get into the forests that surround the hills, of the lower hills of the Galilee. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Lots more coming your way. Stick around. Have fun with us. Going all the way in, we're going down south, didn't it? Yeah, let's get in. Thank you very much. What's down there, Abidor? Uh, I'm not sure. How far are we going? I'm suffering with tunnel vision. I don't know about you. So here we are. We're walking through a 2,000 year old aqueduct. It rocks and absorb the water, fills with water, pressure pushes out the water. You see over here an entire man hewn water tunnel system to bring the water from the springs. And by the force of gravity, the water was fed into the city, which we're going to visit soon. Let's go. Okay. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I believe. Ah, daylight. Okay, so we're following the blue trail, which is on the outskirts of the archaeological site. So we are making our way to the heartland of the city. Oh, but look at this. Beautiful. <laughs> this is something incredible. In the bedrock, you can see they carved out the shape of a basin for the animals to drink. Yep. So this is an animal trough from 2,000 years ago. Right here, and what it does, you can see, it just catches the rainwater. We had a beautiful rain on the way up here, but now a crisp blue afternoon. Cycling. Oh, and look at what Comrade Book has found for us. Magnificent. It's the Rakefet. It's the Rakefet in Hebrew. Cycling. It's a lie. You're a runner. You're not a cycleman. Cycleman. <laughs> You may be used to seeing us in the desert. It's a part of the country we love. But don't be fooled. The land of Israel is green, lush, and beautiful. And if you look around me, these rolling hills of the Galilee, the perfect time of the year in the midst of the winter. Yeah, a heavily wooded land. That's what it was. It's coming back for you. To do is to do. Paradise, friends. Yeah, Dr. Book is just saying wherever you step here, something is below us. And uh, every now and again, you get this rocky outcrop of antiquity. But stay tuned. We've got some impressive archaeology to show you. Are you ready? Look at that. Sephoris. Sephori. Here, a typical Roman road. Wow. Reminds me of Italy. And I did the Verona Marathon and the Venice Marathon. This is what you run on. But here we are in the Holy Land. Be sure to check out the video that we did in Beit She'an Skitopolis. We took you on the cardo, and last time we had a 100 meter dash down the cardo. Mr. Book took that title, but today we're doing something different. We're going to run on the Deca Manus, starting in the east, heading to the west. Have a look at this street. I can see someone walking down. A 2,000 year old street. Doesn't matter where you are, you can just land up here, you'll know your sense of direction. You can see all the grooves. Look how traffic down this road 2,000 years ago made indentations in the rock. But today we're going to use it for something fun. We're going to be doing the 50 meter Decamanus dash. Are you ready? DJ. The 50 meter Decamanus dash, Chantal versus the two books. The book rose. The book rose. 
Okay. On your mark. Get set. Go! He's good. He's kicking up there. Whoa! He did it. The king of Scotopolis and the king of Tsipori. Dr. Book. And uh, we had a tie second. I think Dorian Schmuel. That was frightening. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, now Kusses. Roy, Looks like Greek to me, but doesn't sound like Greek to it me. It says <laughs> Liverpool's next game is <laughs> 2.30 tomorrow. Don't miss it. Go the Reds! Okay, folks, here we are in the center of Tsipori. We've just come off the Decamanos, and boy, oh boy, look what we are finding here. Mosaics are all over the place. And these are a beauty. I don't know why I could like these. These are hearts, heart mosaics. Fruit is in the pudding here. If we add a little bit of water, look at the colors that come out. So when it's dry and it's got that dusty look, don't be fooled. The beauty lies beneath. Love you, babe. You can see they actually are megapixels. These mosaics are much smaller than the average ones we've shown you around the country. And why, why is there such a selection of mosaic carpentry here in the center of town? Is it trying to give off an image of what was happening there 2,000 years ago? Well, this is the prosperous center. This is where all the major merchants have their shops over here. And each merchant has a shop they could in a different way. And one of the major trades here was actually of, um, making mosaics, mosaic workshops. And as Sam said, the smaller the squares, the smaller the DPI, as we call it in computer technology, the more expensive the mosaic, the more detail you could get into the mosaic. So this kind of mosaic with just a pattern is known as a carpet mosaic. It was actually very popular uh, a few centuries after this in Byzantine churches and synagogues because there was no images on it, which is a big contrast to the kind of mosaics we're going to see on this side of the marketplace with a lot of images. And that's not just idle chatter. <laughs> Swastikas. Swastikas, as you see over here, are a very prominent theme. They were on uh, major public buildings, including synagogues. And they were brought by Alexander the Great, who found the symbol in India as a symbol of good luck. And the beautiful geometric designs that became extremely popular in Greco Roman mosaic art. Okay, guys, next time you shop on Amazon, you're going to have to think about the name. Have a look what we found here. The, the original Gal Gadot. The original Gal Gadot on horseback, the Amazon. Now, Dr. Book, Amazon, the name. It's a Greek name. Uh, and the A in Greek means without. And mazon is a dress, which is very interesting because in Hebrew, mazon is a source of food, a source of nurture, and as it is with a woman's breast for feeding the baby. According to Greek mythology, every member of the Amazon tribe, the fierce woman-only warrior tribe, would actually cut off her left breast. So when she pulled the arrow drawstring backwards, it wouldn't get in the way, it wouldn't impede the shot. And if you look at this mosaic over here, you see an Amazon hunting scene where the right breast is very prominent, but there's no left breast because I've been cut off. And this woman over here is about to throw a spear on horseback. So these are the fierce women warriors of Greek legends on this floor. Some of the breast fighters at the edge of the world we've ever seen. You know, they were just trying to keep abreast of the situation. I think we've moved the subject. Let's move on. Oh boy. Just <laughs> have a look at the size of this one. I'm kind of in denial. Excuse the pun. This is the Nile mosaic right here next to the Decamanus. And we're in the tribe of Manasseh. What's the Nile doing here? The Nile, as we all know, is a river in Egypt. This is true. Add to that. All the Egyptian farmland basically depended on the water of the Nile. It was a major source of Egyptian fertility. And everybody in Egypt wanted to know how much water was in the Nile. The Egyptians invented something called the Nilometer, which you can see over here, where they're marking the water level of the Nile. There are these Greek letters over here. 
Um, and this is the river Mile here with all the, you can probably identify the birds and the fish along here, the vegetation, and the African animals everywhere. Nine lometer. This is famous city of Alexandria, built one of the many Alexandrias that Alexander the Great built. And this mosaic was from the time of Egypt in the Ptolemaic period. And that's why I have all the Greek inscriptions. And my favorite of all favorites, the leopard. This one here is a Panthera pardus, the African leopard, of which unfortunately we don't have anymore. Uh, when I met Aliyah 15 years ago, I often went down to Angeri in hope of seeing a leopard. Never got to see it, but please God, we will bring these back. There is an organization in Israel through the Nature Reserve Authority called Chai Bar, who are reintroducing the biblical animals. So stay tuned. We will be spotting the leopard once again. Okay, enough of the puns. So in Gaza, they found exactly the same mosaic, but the face of Orpheus in the middle was the face of King David. So you see that how they combined Judaism, took Greek mythology and incorporated into Judaism, because we all know that David played the harp. But in this case, they had him playing the harp like he was Orpheus taming all the wildlife. So again, classic example of how Jews of the Second Temple period would have taken on the culture that surrounded them, mm -hmm. incorporated into their daily lives, may not have used it as a symbol of idolatry or uh, serving the gods of the Romans, but using the beauty of the West that had reached the East. So in other words, we call this phenomena adaptation without assimilation, or the chameleon effect, how the Jews could take on and incorporate all the good and the beautiful the material culture around them and incorporate it into their Judaism. And we're going to see an amazing example of this. We go and look at one of the 20 synagogues mentioned in the Talmud that's actually been uncovered in Sephori. You'll see the juxtaposition of East and West, or what the Talmud calls Chochmayevanit, Greek wisdom within a Jewish synagogue. And that'll be our next stop once we finish the city center. I feel a theme coming along. Let's use the site and understanding a place that you would have expected the Jews to rebel against Rome during the Great Revolt, there was no rebellion. It's one of the reasons this city survived. The Jews fell to the culture of the Romans, did not rebel. Hence, we have a city that survived history for us to see. But there was a rebellion. If we talk about the times of Herod the Great, Herod the Great dies 4 BCE, and the Jews of this community did rebel. Question is, why didn't they rebel after the, during the times of the destruction of the temple? to be revealed. Next attraction. See you there. All right, Steve, let's oh, head back to the Holy Land. And we've got each one of you. OK. All right, so uh, right now we are going to, before we go to the second part, um, I don't think we have any questions yet about the first part, but any questions, again, you can put on your chat. As to uh, someone mentioned that there was a kibbutz, Sipori was an Arab town. Well, there's no Arab town in Sipori right now. What there's over the uh, main highway, there is an Arab village. Uh, but right now, in, and as you probably know, even though there's no political um, um, disputation about the Galilee, the Galilee uh, is about 60% uh, Arab, both Christian and Muslim and Druze Arab, actually, and about 40% Jewish. So um, on the site of support itself is the National Park, and right on top of it, as I mentioned, is a Moshav. And just to the, uh, the bottom of the valleys, we'll see in the next video, is the settlement of Hoshaya, uh, the Jewish uh, modern Orthodox town of Hoshaya. So basically, what we've got over here um, is um, a site that's not really that visited. In fact, in Israel, if people want to go to a Roman type city, most people go to Caesarea simply because it's very convenient to get to. It's just north of Tel Aviv, it's on the coast, there's a lot of public transportation, there's trains, there's buses, and most people go there. But the other two major Roman sites in Israel are much less visited. One, of course, is Bet Shan, which, unlike Caesarea, actually has a genuine Roman, uh, Roman theater. The one in Caesarea has been mainly rebuilt onto uh, the original foundation. 
uh, whereas in Bet Shaan, the whole bottom third of the original amphitheater survived. And of course, the Roman ruins there are a lot more impressive, more like the Pompeii of Israel. And Sepori itself, which again, because of its location, is much less visited than its sister Roman cities. But as we've seen right now, and also in the next video we're going to see, there's a lot to see there. There's a phenomenal amount of mosaics and Roman buildings and history from a Jewish perspective, from a Christian perspective, and also just from the pagan perspective. Uh, as far as Christianity goes, even though it's not mentioned specifically in the New Testament, it was the major city. You can literally see Nazareth, which then was a little village on the hill overlooking Sepori, and for sure, without a doubt, a young Jewish boy called Joshua ben Yosef, Joshua the son of Joseph, otherwise known as Jesus of Nazareth, when they wanted to go to the big city. For them, the big city, of course, for the Jews in the Galilee was Tsipori, where he'd wander around and see their phenomenal uh, culture and uh, mix, uh, cosmopolitan mix. In fact, the language of all the inscriptions found in Tsipori is actually Greek, which was the uh, cosmopolitan language as opposed to Aramaic. And we'll see that when we when we examine the synagogue, we'll see that the vast majority of the little bit of Hebrew and Aramaic, but 90% of all the inscriptions are actually in Greek. So it was very much a worldly city. Uh, and today at the bottom of Tsipori, uh, there's actually a beautiful church called the Saint Santa Anna Church, which is a Byzantine church destroyed by the Muslims because everyone kills each other for the same loving God. And then uh, they built a mosque there. Then along came the Crusaders and destroyed the mosque and rebuilt the church again, which was again destroyed after the Crusaders left. But the site of Saint Anna's church with this abscess is also um, just at the bottom of the hill of Tsipori. So we're going to focus now um, on a, the new part of Tsipori, which of course is the actual synagogue itself. So I'm going to share my screen right over here, uh, and you will see, share, I hope, and you'll see something that says uncovering the synagogue. Can you see that? Steve, can you see it? Yep. All right, cool. So over here, again, like everything in Israel, you would seems discovered by accident. In 1993, they were expanding the site because it was slowly becoming popular. So they decided to build another parking lot inside the site. And lo and behold, they found the synagogue. It happens all the time in Israel. Another great example is in Jerusalem when they were expanding Binyanei Ha'umar, the convention center. They just happened to find when they um, when the modern contractors built, started digging, they just happened to find a 10th Roman legion a pottery workshop, the only one of its kind in the entire Roman Empire under the ground. And then there was this battle between the contractors who had the contract and the archaeologists who wanted to save it. And the result today is if you go to that modern convention center in Jerusalem, you'll see a 20th century modern building with a glass floor. And underneath the glass floor, you can see a 2000 year old Roman armory workshop. So over here in the Galilee, they once they found this, they couldn't obviously build that parking lot. So they moved the parking lot a bit further towards the north. And what you have here is a unique synagogue. Um, this is how it looked when it was excavated. What we're going to do, both in the movie afterwards, and now I'm going to give you a brief introduction, is examine what makes this special. You see, it's very, very narrow, the synagogue itself. And uh, like all other synagogues, faces towards the south, because it's in the north of Israel, so it faces towards J-Town, the big J, Jerusalem. Uh, and how do we know it's a synagogue? Well, the obvious giveaway is there's donor plaques, because Jews don't like building anything without putting their names on it. So uh, it's not a new phenomenon. It goes all the way back to the temple itself. We're in that second temple in Jerusalem, there was actually a gate called Nicanor's Gate. Any ideas who donated it? Yes, that's right. A wealthy Jew called Nicanor, all the way from Cyprus, donated it. And he wanted his name on the gate. And it is, if you look in the Talmud, in the tractate of Midot, or measurements, they, they talk about Nicanor's gate. So here we have, before you see any Jewish symbols, the donor names and their Jewish names. And they're written in Aramaic, actually, these names, not in Greek, but in Aramaic. And this one over here says, uh, the one you can see over here, uh, Zahula Tova at the end. May we be remembered for good Tanum, the son of Yodan, and Semcha, and Naharai, the sons of Tahum, Amen. Uh, and you can see the Aleph, Mem, Nun for Amen over here. 
which is also uh, very much a feature. So you see it like a kind of carpet mosaic design that we talked about in the town itself, where there's nothing really that offends the eye from a Jewish second commandment point of view. There's no images, it's just beautiful geometric designs. And the donor names in it could also be a mosque. It must also have many designs with, uh, with letters, with calligraphy, and also with, um, with art and geometrical designs as well. And that, of course, is why Maimonides says it's okay for Jews to go to mosques. There's no idols or idol or graven images. But when we move in, as we're going to see both in the movie, but right now, you start seeing all sorts of images. In fact, you see seven panels crammed with images. Uh, the first uh, panel over here, well, let me just, well, that went back again. The first panel, you see a story. And the whole um, synagogue has a theme from promise to redemption, we're about to see. So the promise, of course, is the original promise that Abraham and Sarah were given by God. And over here on the panel, you see, again, Greek writing, not Hebrew, not Aramaic, but Greek, which is very interesting because the Jews we mentioned were very cosmopolitan, and they felt more comfortable having Greek on their synagogue floor, uh, similar to today, where we would be more comfortable maybe as English speakers having English inscriptions as opposed to Hebrew. And uh, even though only the top of it is actually preserved, because the rest was destroyed in that earthquake in the eighth century, you can clearly see it's a woman's head standing in a doorway. And remarkably, the Byzantine artists, again, because the Jews didn't just use Jewish artists, they used Christian artists as well, um, uh, was obviously working from a copy book. Because in uh, Italy, in a church called Raverna, a city called Raverna, we have exactly a very similar picture. We see a woman here standing with a uh, inside a building, inside of a doorway, and next to her in the church in Raverna, whoops, keep skipping, uh, you see the three wise men or the angels from the Abraham story coming to tell Abraham that he's about to, and Sarah, they're about to have a child despite their age. So it's very interesting from cross-pollination, we can see from a church in Italy, what that picture would have had and from a synagogue in the Holy Land of Israel itself. So the bottom panel has the story of Abraham being told uh, and Sarah that they're going to have a child and Sarah of course laughs because how can I have a child when I'm 90 years old? But of course anything's possible. And the second panel you see what Abraham was told to do with that child, which is uh, to sacrifice him. The second panel, you can see very clearly on the left side, two boys, a uh, youth and a donkey. And that's what the story from Genesis is all familiar with, where Abraham is told to go. And it says, Abraham mugdam He gets up early in the morning. And in addition to Yitzhak, his son Isaac, who wasn't a little boy, by the way, he was about 37. Uh, he also took the Kashtena He took two youth and a donkey with him. And again, the whole story is on top. It's in Greek to you and Greek to me, because it's in Greek. Um, and basically, this is the Bible passages translated to Greek, which kind of points to the fact they weren't even in this time in the fifth, sixth century, weren't too familiar with Hebrew. It was more of a liturgical language like Latin in a Catholic church. And the Jews read it, but didn't really understand it. So when they were writing the inscriptions, they actually translated to Greek on their floor. So this is the almost near province. Of course, it never happened, the sacrifice. Instead, if you look over here, you can see a goat caught in the, uh, the bush. And that's from the Bible. It says, Hine ha'ayo. Behold, here is the goat. And Abraham is told just before he's about to sacrifice Isaac, al tishlach et yadcha. Don't send out your hand. Don't sacrifice him. And that's when he's given the promise, which is you'll be as multitude as the stars in the sky and the sands on the earth. That's the promise. The third band over here is the most interesting part of the entire floor. And that of course is a pagan Greek zodiac in Greek with the featuring complete with sun goddess Helios in the middle of the synagogue floor, which might lead you to ask the following question. What is a nice pagan God doing in a synagogue floor? Uh, clearly that is a contradiction. The second commandment says, do not have graven images, never mind graven gods. And yet over here, uh, we have the sun god Helios in the middle of a zodiac, which is again a Greek, uh, Greco-Roman phenomena in this floor. And this is something we're going to talk about in the video itself, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. What I'm going to tell you is it's not unique. There are many synagogues, ancient synagogues in Israel, not just this one, that feature zodiacs in the middle. Over here, the the Helios, the sun god, is shown as the sun. 
But in Tiberius, just down the road, you actually have a image of uh, Helios. You also see over here in the corner, four women who are, represent the four different seasons of the year. Right, this over here says Tukufat Nisan, the spring season. Um, and so again, you have women on a synagogue floor, you have Greek gods on a synagogue floor, you have people in their birthday suits. This is two men, the, the Gemini, the twins, who are not wearing anything except their birthday suits. So this is not what you'd expect in a town where Rabbi Yuda Nasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, who wrote the Mishnah, lived, to see in a synagogue Greek writing, pagan gods, full frontal nudity, women, like what is going on over here, all right? So this is something we will be able to discuss further after you've seen the video. This is just something for you guys to think about and hopefully ask some intelligent questions in that chat section. All right, some details of that, which again, we'll see in the video. Here's one of the women on the side, Tukufat Tevet. This is from the Tevet time of year. This is the, um, the archer. You can see over here shown as a uh, mythological half horse, half human. Um, this is Cancer, the, the, the crab over here, just some of the details. And here's some other ones you see around Israel. This is in Tiberias, this is in Bet Alpha. This is more sort of like folk art. But again, as you see, it's a theme you see all over Israel. The fourth band shows you what they wanted. At the end of the day, these synagogues uh, were built after the structure of the temple. They yearned for a temple to be rebuilt. So the next few bands focus on uh, the actual um, uh, service that happened in the temple itself. So here you can see the Festival of Fruits, Shavuot, which is what we're counting towards right now. What we're doing when we count the Omer between Passover and Shavuot. This was the Harvest Festival. This is what the American holiday of Thanksgiving is based on, when they would bring the first fruits to the temple. So over here, you see those first fruits in the basket and some of the musical instruments, the symbols the Levites would play the showbread table, the actual altar itself. Again, this is all yearning for the temple. Here's the altar on that fifth band, much closer up, complete with horns on it. On the sixth band, we'll talk about uh, afterwards, you have the menorah on both sides, the shofar for our redemption, to blow the shofar and bring in from the four corners of the earth, uh, the remnants of Israel. And you have the Lulav and Etrog, also from the holiday of Sukkot from the temple. And in the middle, you have either the picture of the temple facade or the Ark of the Holy Covenant. So that is what we're yearning towards, that redemption, that rebuild temple. And uh, over here, you can see a nice picture of it. And of course, uh, here it is depicted on a coin from the Bar Kokhba revolt, the facade. And then finally, the seventh band, we are, have the lion representing Judah, the Jews coming back to Judah, back to their land. And in the middle over here, the guy who gave the most amount of money who has a serious donor plaque right over here on the top uh, front center next to the ark itself. So that's really what we're going to see on the floor. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to go and look inside the synagogue. And of course, because this is an interesting, different type of video, we are going to go and run to the synagogue. Uh, before we get to the synagogue, we're going to look at the Roman theater on top of it. And also the house with the Mona Lisa um, of the Galilee mosaic called the Dionysus house, which is right smack bang in the Jewish quarter. So obviously a very wealthy Jew owned this house, maybe even Rabbi Yudha Nasi himself, uh, who, the, who the Mishnah mentions his wealth and his friendship with the Roman, um, uh, with the Roman uh, Caesar uh, as well. So we're going to hop back into Tsipori right now, or I should say run back into Tsipori. Uh, and we're going to go and explore the site immediately north of the synagogue and then the synagogue itself. And feel free to ask any questions in the comment section. And Steve, we're going to cut this off the synagogue. I'll let you know when. <laughs> Okay, it's a steep climb. We're heading to the citadel, to the house of Dionysus. Dionysus, we'll have an entertainment break on the way. Good idea. It's quite a hill. Come on, put in some effort. The Eshkol Valley, it's green, it's gorgeous. It's a lifeline of the land, a national water carrier, pumping water from the Sea of Galilee, comes through this valley to the center of Israel. Oh, love the north. Actually, love the south. I love the east. 
I love the West. I love everything. So grateful for the land. Moving on. Ruins of Tsipori, but it's not in ruins. Look beyond the view, through the fig tree, try and figure that out. That is a modern established town named Hoshaya. We need to get entertained. Where was the place of entertainment? Well, we don't have to dream about it or read, it, read about it in a book. Here it is for us to see. Are you not entertained? In Gladiator the movie, here we are in the orchestra. Check out Skitopolis, the show that we did in the Greek city of Bechean. You can see the seats of the theater. Now, during Greek times, you would have expected this theater would have been built in order to see the view. Today, we can see the view, but if you notice this iron structure behind me, this is what you call a scanner France. So after the Greeks came the Romans, they were not interested in the view. They actually blocked the view by building the scanner France, and everybody sitting in these seats would be entertained on the orchestra where we are. So fascinating history here in Sipori. But, you know, thinking about it, the Romans, the Roman period, is it relevant to us? Do we need to learn about this history? Well, I don't know. They were the first to provide us with aqueducts for irrigation, um, okay. roads, um, education, mm. uh, public safety, mm. um, and of course, wine. And anything else? Besides that, what did the Romans ever do for us? He's got a point. I don't know. Beats me. Nothing. No time to waste. Let's roam around. Run, run, run. We're just about to meet some friends. Hoping we can get some drone footage for you. This magnificent sight. Stay tuned. Ready, set. So folks, there you have it. During the Roman times, people would enjoy a view. Here we are using a drone to get a view they would never have had from above. Who says that it doesn't get better with age, with time? Exactly. What did the Romans ever do for us? Exactly. exactly. Who developed this DJI Mavic Mini? Not the Romans. <laughs> it's called Israeli technology. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Be good. Welcome to the house of Dionysus. At the bottom here, you can see the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. And it uh, doesn't matter where you are in this building, she's looking at you. She's looking at Part of the reason we know that this is aristocracy, here we have the royal flush. This is the lavatory. Now to have running water and a lavatory next to your house during those times is a sign of wealth. And it looks like Greek to me. Dr. Book, come a little closer. Uh, we heard you read Greek earlier. <laughs> we heard you read that Greek earlier. What does that say? Greek to you and Greek to me. But it actually says la briote in the modern Hebrew, which would be to health. health. The sun is dipping, but where else on planet Earth can you decide to go and dub in the afternoon prayers in an ancient synagogue? So that's where we're heading, to a Beit Knesset, a house of gathering from the Mishnaic period, Mincha, the afternoon prayers. There will be a Kiddush provided sponsored by, by, sponsored by the <laughs> Okay, folks, here we are. It's not often that you have to wait to get into a synagogue, but that's what we're doing. And 
Dr. Book has actually done his graduate research on this synagogue, so he's going to give us the seven key facts of this incredible site here in Tsipori. This synagogue, like many incredible artifacts in Israel, was found totally by accident. The Talmud relates that Tsipori had so many Jews in it, there was many synagogues. And even if there was one Jew, let's be honest, that he would still build two synagogues. We know why, right? Tell me. The one you go to and the one you would never be seen dead in. <laughs> so they found, until the synagogue, they found a brief inscription that mentioned one of the synagogues. And this particular one, back in 1993, they were just literally building a parking lot for the visitor of traffic. And boom, they found this stunning Byzantine period synagogue. Let's go and take a look. Check it out. Mimche? Mimche? Mimche. Welcome to Shul. The Beit Knesset, the house of prayer, the house of gathering. You won't believe this. Wow. Wow. Facing Jerusalem, seven panels, seven themes. Dr. Book, take it away. <laughs> or Yohanna Lucha. Seven. We're going to talk about the number seven. Seven is a very significant number. The Jews sanctify the seventh, and here we are in a place of sanctity. Bring it down for us, Dr. Book. Panel number one. Okay, panel number one is the beginning of the promise theme. Over here is Sarah being told by the angels that she will be expecting a son, and she laughed, and therefore the son was called Yitzhak. Panel number two. Are the two boys and the donkey going to Hamoria, where Abraham told them, we will go and we will come back. And there's the next panel, you can see Hinei Ha'ayol, there is the goat. Not Mariah. Right. Panel number three. Panel number three is a central panel of this entire synagogue, which is a zodiac mosaic, a galgal mazalot in Hebrew. And you might ask yourselves, why is there a Greek god, a Greek mosaic in the middle of a nice Jewish floor? all back to the same theme, adaptation without assimilation. In the middle of this panel, you see the Greek god Helios, the sun god, you see the sun and the chariot, and the 12 panels around, you see the 12 months of the year and the 12 zodiac symbols known as Mazalot in Hebrew. That's why we say Mazal Tov, you should have a good star. And the four corners, you have the four different seasons represented by women in different dress for different seasons, the Sam, Tevet, Tammuz, Tishri. Panel number four. Panel number four, we have the beginning of the redemption, Zecha le Migdash. Over here, the next four panels are to do with the temple itself and our hope to have a rebuilt temple. So these three rectangles in panel number four show things that happen in the temple. The Shokhatz it's rot, the musical instrument, the sacrifices, the showbread table, the offering of the fruits, all these are vessels of the temple and the signs in Greek and in Hebrew. Panel number five. Panel number five, we have the sacrificial altar itself. You see the two horns of the altar, can name is Beach, and over here the animals being led to the sacrifice. Panel number six. Panel number six, you have the hope of our redemption. You have the ark with the Torah, or some say the facade of the temple itself. And on each side, the menorah's planet. So the menorah are the lulav and etrog and the shofar, all used in temple ritual. Panel number seven. And finally, panel number seven, we have the Lion of Judah on both sides. The Jews who once again return to Judah in the hope of 2,000 years, Hatik Vashna Tophayim, Liot and Chofshi Bar Tzedem. And this synagogue remained buried under the ground until it was uncovered by the new Jews back in our land from promise to redemption. So let's live out that promise. We're going to be doing the afternoon prayers, Mincha, in the ancient synagogue. But before we do, Viggy Abigdor is going to give us a show. Press play, please. Let the show begin. Popcorn and Coke.
the synagogue experience. We sure did. We've made use of the night we've had, um, but just plugging in back to the synagogue and the theme of what we've managed to achieve in Zippori. Adaptation without assimilation. We went to a Jewish holy building and yet saw beautiful Byzantine art mosaics. We saw Greek in it. We saw adaptation of Roman gods. And all of this was in a Jewish setting. The chameleon effect. The Jews managed to take all the good of the surrounding culture and incorporate it within their Judaism. It wasn't either will be part of the outside world or will be Jewish. It's Torah in their hand. Torah with the way of the and that's the side of Tipori, really combining all of those aspects. And inside the synagogue, we were so touched by the song Shir Lama Alot, the Songs of Essence, Psalm 121. And uh, we'd like to thank Avigdor Book for joining us on the journey. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe and follow the channel. There's lots more coming. Not only tourism, there's running. We'll be doing some epic running in 2021. It could be the comrades, the holy comrades back in the land from Jaffa to Jerusalem, but we'll finish off with a song, and the song goes as follows. Shira Malot, Esaena El Hearim, Me'ayin Yabo Ezri, Ezri Me'im Hashem, Ose Shamayim Aliten la motraglecha, ayanum shovecha, hine lo yanum, velo ishan shomer ishan, From whereupon comes my help, from the God, the creator of all. As I look towards the mountains and the essence of Israel, you've got to come and visit. Come home, be appreciative and grateful for the land we have, for you, for me, for everybody. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi. Sons of rabbis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it's time for some news. All right. All right. Over to you, Steve, to hear some of these questions. Okay, Sylvia, so where to begin? Let me just go back through the questions and, um, and let's see what we've got. Um, so we've got um, a, a lady who's asked the question saying that she visited, um, she last visited Sipori in, in about 2009. So, you know, 12 or so years ago. Um, and that she'd like to know more about any new disco discoveries over that period of time. Um, also, can you provide any pointers to read about this research? And do you know what the opening hours of Tsipori are? <laughs> the most That's the technical thing. Like the opening hours are like, you can look on there, and they have this amazing technology called a website. And you can actually look on the, the Israel National Parks also has English and Hebrew. So you can look on the English website, and it tells you in winter and summer, there's different opening hours. Usually in summer, it's from nine until five or six. And in winter, it's usually from nine until four, depending on when it gets dark. But that's on the website, the opening hours. Uh, as far as new stuff, of course, every single, uh, the, 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 the dig is going on the whole time. So there's always new stuff. Amongst the new stuff put in, of course, are those films, those amazing films that are both in the synagogue itself, uh, which they take you back in time so you can meet the people who lived there in the second and third century. Uh, and also, and there's a new visitor center as you come in, which also has some more of those films as well. So that's all brand new. And just next to the visitor center, when they once again were clearing space for parking lots, they found a massive outdoor, uh, they think it might be a swimming pool or water aqueduct, another one, uh, just last year. And those excavations in the city center where they're uncovering more and more mosaics are going on. So every time you visit, even if you haven't been there for half a year, there's always new stuff there. It's continuously expanding. Okay, that's great. Um, just for that lady who asked the question, I've just posted the, the link to the website via the Israel National Parks uh, website. Right. Uh, so, so you can find out all the information there. Um, so just uh, bear with me whilst I go backwards. Um, okay, so you touched on, you've touched uh, quite often in, in this on, on astrology. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, so a gentleman asked, um, wasn't astrology forbidden? 
Um, someone else in the chat asked, um, uh, uh, responded saying, as far as as far as they knew, the rabbis used astrology for various purposes. Maybe you can um, just embellish on that a, a little bit. For, for, for... Yes, of course. Well, there's a great discussion in the Talmud, and that is how susceptible are Jews to what they call in the Talmud Chochma Yevanit, which literally means Greek wisdom. Like, aren't, didn't the Jews fight against this Greek wisdom of the whole story of the Maccabees and Hanukkah and the Hasmoneans? What's going on over here? It turns out the Jews are very, very open to certain aspects of Greek wisdom, which didn't include uh, polytheism. So the Talmud itself actually contains many, many words in Greek, uh, from words such as prosdor, which means corridor, to a word we're all familiar with on the Passover Seder when we, we talk about the Afrikoman, also a Greek word. So many Greek words. But more interestingly than that, there's also many, many examples of cross-cultural pollination. I refer to this as the chameleon effect. And wherever Jews live, even to this day, if you visit synagogues all over the world, you'll always see how the local Jews incorporate the customs and culture and the art of wherever they live into their synagogues, into their Jewish lives. So when I was in India a few years ago, I went to some Indian synagogues, and believe it or not, they have lots of wood carvings and lotus flowers and colors and brass, just like you'd see in a Hindu temple, but of course, without the pagan images. So they were very much influenced by the art in India. If you go to synagogues in Italy, you'll see, especially in Venice, they're influenced by the Catholic uh, churches without the pagan symbols. So wherever the Jews live, they always managed to do this thing called adaptation without assimilation, where they would adapt to all the good things of the prevalent culture and then just incorporate to their Judaism. In this particular case, it might seem jarring to us many centuries later to see pagan gods and zodiac symbols in synagogues, to them it was perfectly normal. To this day, if you want to wish someone good luck in Hebrew, what do you say? You hear it at every Jewish wedding. Mazal tov, or mazal tov, right? Mazal is the Hebrew word for star. So you're wishing someone good luck, they should have a good star. Uh, the, the zodiac and the stars should be uh, meaningful and significant for them. And the Talmud has many discussions to talk about the star you're born under, really is significant and meaningful to you in your life. And of course, like good Jews, what they did is they just adapted and incorporated. So as you might see, Gemini or the twins, what do the Jews see? Oh, that's the story of Jacob and Esau. Or as you might see the most important star sign, which we all know is Leo, uh, the lion. Um, they say, no, that's not a pagan symbol. That is the lion that Samson wrestled, or that is the lion of Judah. So in other words, every pagan symbol got a, a Jewish conversion that have a Jewish meaning. Uh, and whilst you might see Helios, the sun god, they say, no, that is just the power and the light of the god. Uh, of who, what we call Hashem or Adonai Elohim. In other words, they didn't look upon these symbols as pagan symbols, just like the mosaic we saw in the first section of the film showed Orpheus uh, taming the wild animals, a very famous Greek myth, by playing the harp. What did the Jews say? Which famous Jew do we know who played the harp? King David. King David. No, that's not Orpheus. That's King David playing the harp. So in other words, they would take what were very popular symbols in the surrounding culture and Judaize the symbols. So to them, it was perfectly normal, even though it might strike us as rather incongruous. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, so so about the mosaics, um, yeah. your your colleague, I, sorry, I, his name is... is... Sam Shmuel. Shmuel. Um, he 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 pointed out how the colours were enhanced when you put some when you wet them when you put mm -hmm. some. Water. Someone's asked, are those even even in their enhanced state when you pour the water on them? Are those mosaic colours um, the the original colours, or have they been physically enhanced over over the years? All right. So, the, so, so I see. There's a, uh, apparently there's a few questions about the mosaics. One is like, oh my God, you're walking on them. That is because there's certain mosaics you can't actually walk on. Listen, if they've stood the test of time for centuries, that's what they were designed for. They were designed to be walked on. So certain mosaics are rope top where you can't actually walk on them, and certain you could just walk on even today because they were designed. It's not just like a flimsy piece of 
tile, there's a whole substructure underneath it. So certain mosaics today, if you visit Sibor, you can walk on certain are clearly roped off, which you can't. And yeah. about the colors, yes, that is the original colors. Um, we didn't, of course, pour water on them because that's not uh, um, suggested. Rather, most of them are actually outdoors. So when it rains, like we were there just after huge rainfall, so we actually got to see a lot of the colors. It's just dust on top. But the yeah. colors, the original colors, and to show you the wealth of Sitapuri, many of those colored rocks are not even available in Israel. So they have to import some of those colors from Italy and from Greece and from Egypt, from other countries. So it was a very, very wealthy town. Um, and just recently, if you saw the news uh, this morning, actually, because things are always happening in Israel, in a town um, called Yavna, which is close to Ashkelon and Ashdod, uh, they found a beautiful Byzantine period mosaic floor, which everybody thought was white, because it looked like it was just white floor. But on closer inspection, the archaeologists found it was actually patina that had formed on the floor, and they cleaned it off and found a beautiful multicolored mosaic. So if you look at the Jerusalem Post or the Times of Israel today, you see yet another colorful mosaic floor that was revealed in all of its glory. It's a daily occurrence uh, in Israel. Yeah, truly, truly, the, the the land, yeah, the land holds the key to the to the past. Um, got another question here. So this goes back to the to the to the zodiac element. Um, mm -hmm. the interesting one. Um, the, 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 the person asking the question says that they've heard a great theory that the zodiac tie is up exactly with the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, if Judaism had incorporated the zodiac, would this explain its suitability to appear in shuls? Yeah, 100%. It's not just in ancient shuls, even in modern shuls. Uh, my father was a rabbi in Brighton, and there's a synagogue there called the Middle Street Synagogue. And they also have like a mosaic on their windows of, uh, of zodiacs, like a stained glass window design with the zodiacs. So it's actually quite a, it's followed through 12 tribes, 12 zodiac symbols. It's all to do with that Judaizing uh, the culture that was around them. And by the way, this is full of images, which is quite interesting, but later on, some of the synagogues were influenced by Byzantine culture, like the one in Jericho, for example, and only has a carpet mosaic with no images on, except for a menorah in the middle of the floor. Okay, got another one here. Um, was not the writing of the Mishnah a reaction to the pervasive influence of Roman law? And then the Gemara follows as development of case law and academia. And now we're getting very esoteric. I have to answer that one extremely quickly. And that is in Judaism, we have two types of law. We have the law that was written, the Torah Shabiktav, the Torah that we read, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, the Bible, the Tanakh. And then we have the oral explanation which the written law doesn't make sense without it. So for example, it talks about a mezuzah, it just says, put them on your doorpost, it doesn't say what them is, or tefillin doesn't describe what things are, or the laws of keeping kashrut. So clearly there was an oral explanation. What is interesting is that Tsipuri, the town we looked at today, was one of the centers of the Sanhedrin. After the destruction of Judea, southern Judah, and by the Romans in 135, at the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Jewish center moved to the Galilee, and the rabbinical court, the Sanhedrin, moved from city to city, and it ended up around the second century, end of the third century, sorry, 200, in Sipori, and that's where the Mishnah itself was finally completed. Now, the Mishnah was written in Hebrew, because that was the Jewish language of scholarship, but most people didn't understand it. And that's why the Talmud, the explanation of the Mishnah was actually written Aramaic, which is more commonly understood by the common people. And the idea was to write down the oral law because they figured that as Jews would be exiled and killed and sent all over the world, the oral law might be forgotten. So it wasn't really a reaction to the Roman law. It was rather to write down an existing Jewish oral tradition before it was too late and people forgot what that oral tradition was. Okay. Um, there's something, uh, someone's asked uh, about the synagogue at Sipori. Was there a mikvah? Um, the, 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 the synagogue itself, uh, when you first come into it, there's a huge water system because water is very important. And Mayim Chaim and Torah Chaim, the water is a symbol of life, the Torah is a symbol of life. So it's usually, it's not unusual to find a synagogue next, with a mikvah next to it. For example, in Gamla or... Uh, in the in the Golan, there's a there's a mikvah literally right next door. In this case, there's not a mikvah 
right next to the synagogue, but the synagogue itself is next to the Jewish neighborhood. It's replete with mikvah art. So people probably dip in the local mikvah and then just pop down to shul. So there are plenty of mikvahs we know is a Jewish neighborhood, yes. Okay, I've uh, got another question here. Did not, the, well, you've, you, yes, you've, you've said this about the Sanhedrin. Did, did not the Sanhedrin hold court there? Um, you, uh, yeah, it did, but it ultimately ended up in Tiberias, but it was there for a number of decades. Um, and then we've got another uh, final question here. Could the zodiac signs, back to the zodiac again, be anything to do with very early Freemasonry? Uh, what's the secret? We can't talk about it. <laughs> we'll have to ask the Nobly Knees Club about that. We don't know, and all the secret handshakes and everything. But it is a well-known thing that early Freemasonry did take Jewish symbols, and they saw themselves as, as architects, such as Solomon itself. So there are some Jewish symbols within Freemasonry. But the reality is that Jews are very freely borrowed from the prevalent cultures around them, very freely, wherever they lived. They were definitely not cut off. Uh, in fact, the Talmud even says, Al Sibor, don't cut yourself off from the world around you. Be part of that world around you. So when you have uh, self-ghettoizing Jews who live in ultra-Orthodox enclaves such as Stamford Hill or Meir Sharim or Borough Park, that's not the traditional Jewish way. The traditional Jewish way is to be part of the world around you and incorporate all the goodness within your Judaism and... Uh, be part of that world and connected to it and lead by example and be a light to the nations, not to cut yourself off into a self-imposed ghetto. So it's actually quite uh, totally normal to see all the symbols of whatever country you are and the artwork and the designs within your synagogue itself. Uh, and also it's very interesting that Judaism was the only culture at the time that had universal education where both men and women were fully literate and that's why it's not unusual to see images of women inside synagogues and even women mentioned in the donor plaque names as well. And of course, the one question you should have all asked, which no one asked is, where's the Mechitza, right? How do we know it's a synagogue if there's no Mechitza? And the answer is, and this shocked many of you, that all the ancient synagogues in the land of Israel, literally from the first ones and Masada and Herodian, all the way up to the seventh century, there doesn't exist one synagogue with a Mechitza or a gender separation in, which leads to the next question, which is, I'm waiting to hear it. You can type it if you want. So again, there are tens and tens of ancient synagogues and none of them have uh, gender separation. So what, what, what is this saying? When did it come in? And that's a very good question. We don't actually know. So there's three theories. One is that only men prayed because women were barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. The other theory is there were separate, separate praying, praying uh, um, times where well, we one session for men and one session for women and the third theory shock horror is they prayed together and why is that third theory actually kind of maybe semi-likely because don't forget that the synagogue this synagogue in support all synagogues were based on the temple right in fact in the time of the called the migdash ma'at or the small temple as opposed to the bet migdash the temple itself and in the temple uh men women and children families went together to the temple went around the temple platform but if you wanted there were separate meditation sections so there was what's a room called the Ezrat Nashim if women wanted to meditate just with women there was another one called the Ezrat Levim if the Levites wanted separate meditation there was another one called Ezrat Nazirim and people who take the Nazarite vow if they wanted separate meditation but the service itself was an entire family unit without any kind of separation at all maybe just maybe uh the gender separation is relatively recent from the sixth or seventh century and once upon a time in the ancient synagogues just as in the temple uh, jews did pray together in family units there is no conclusive evidence for any of those three theories they're just the three theories that are out there right now but it is pretty interesting that you the the women in ancient times had a lot more central roles than you'd see in other ancient uh, cultures and societies, including being literate, including being mentioned uh, in the inscriptions themselves. And the Judaism back then was a lot more open and colorful than we think that it was. 
Okay, and um, got another another one here back about the Sanhedrin again. When was when? What period? When was the Sanhedrin based in 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 Tiberia? In oh, Tiberia, you mean? Oh, well, according to the the Mishnah and Perkei there's a whole list of cities. Like so, after the temple was destroyed, it started off in Yavne, then from Yavne moved to Usha. Uh, this is after the Bar Kokhba world. From Usha went to Bet Sharim, which is today Necropolis uh, near Haifa, also a national park. Uh, and then from Bet Shalom, it went to Tsipori, and from Tsipori, finally, it ended up in Tiberias, where the Jerusalem Talmud was written, or the Talmud of the land of Israel. It wasn't written in Jerusalem, it was written in Tiberias, because this was the Byzantine period, and Jews were not allowed into Jerusalem, except on Tisha B'Av. Um, so it was in Sipori around the second, the end of the third century, it was in Sipori. But then for the remaining two centuries uh, before the Talmud was written, it was actually in Tiberias, which is uh, about 20 or 30 kilometers away, right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee or the Kinneret. So, so when were the last Jews in, in Sipori? And, and what happened? Uh, probably... Uh, it looks like around the time of the Muslim conquest, because uh, as we mentioned, everyone kills each other in the name of the same loving God. So when the Muslims came in, in the 637 was the Muslim conquest, the Battle of Yarmouk. That is when there's basically a terminal decline of uh, the remaining Jews who lived in Israel. And of course, that finally finished off in the 8th century with that massive earthquake in 749 that devastated the whole of northern Israel. And that really marked the, uh, the death knell of uh, the majority of the Jews in Israel, even though there was always a continuous Jewish presence, specifically in the town of Piki'in, yeah, also in the Galilee, where Jews who'd lived there could trace their way back all the way back to the Second Temple and the four holy cities of Hebron, Jerusalem, Svat, and Tiberias, where there'd been more or less a continuous Jewish presence for two millennia. But the vast majority of communities were devastated in that earthquake, combined with the Muslim conquest, basically, was the death knell of the Jewish, rich Jewish life in the Galilee. Well, it's it's been a very fascinating evening again with with you, Tuvia. Um, I hope that everyone's enjoyed it, um, and and that you've you've all taken something from it. Um, we we have some very interesting uh, uh, events coming up. We've got we're back with Tuvia again this coming um, Sunday evening at seven o'clock for our inspirational Zionist series of webinars. And this time, uh, Tuvia will be shining a focus on um, Golda Meir, Israel's very own Iron Lady. So um, do, do look at our Facebook, do look at our Twitter. If you're signed up to our newsletter, you will have received details of that. Um, I'll also send details in a follow-up email tomorrow, so please do consider joining us for that. And then um, beyond that, uh, Wednesday next week, the 5th of, of May, in the evening, we have um, we have a gentleman by the name of Naftali, Naftali Aklum, who is of Ethiopian descent and lives in Besheva. And he uh, was a consultant on the Netflix film, the, the Hollywood film that went to Netflix, The Red Sea Diving Resort. And it's all about the, the Ethiopians and, and the Red Sea exodus that happened from, from Sudan when they, when, they, when, they, when they all fled over and, and returning home to, to, to their homeland in Israel. Um, so join us for that. Um, and thank you again on behalf of us, the ZF of the UK and Ireland and the WZO of the UK. Uh, we really do appreciate you, you joining us. And I think